what consumer neuroscience doesn't do is tap into a buy button in the brains of consumers. And what consumer neuroscience doesn't do is create advertising that makes consumers uh, into robots and automatons who blindly move away from free will and buy whatever advertisers want. Because if we did find a buy button, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to spend a little time talking about what we do do. And the way I'm going to do that is talk about five lessons from concern, consumer neuroscience that I share with marketers <clears throat> all over the world. And I want you to get a flavor for the diversity of the tools and, and the way we think about the problems that marketers are facing today. So first, uh, I want to put up a slide that, that most marketers understand uh, painfully well which is that the world that we live in today is not the world that many of us grew up in. Consumers now can watch what they want, when they want, where they want, and how they want. And I grew up in a world where the television was an entertainment device, the telephone was a communication device, and the computer was a productivity device. And now all these screens are all those things and more to a generation of really humans on this planet for the first time. And often the question is asked, why does Nielsen, the Nielsen company, which is the largest company in the world that, that measures what people buy and what people watch all over the world have a chief neuroscientist. And I think the simple answer to that question is, in order to really understand this world, we have to understand something about this world. So the human brain uh, it has between 80 and 100 billion neurons, each one making between 10 and 20 thousand connections. It's thought to be one of the most complex entities in the known universe. And what's really cool is you all have one. And I make very, very few guarantees in life. But I guarantee that the brain you walked in with tonight and sat down is not the brain you're going to leave with tonight. Why? Because as I'm presenting to you and as you listen to uh, the other speakers on the panel, you will be directing your attention to pieces of information. And some of that information is going to generate an emotional response in the deep centers of the brain. And some of that information is going to lay down a memory trace. And maybe for some of you, it may alter your behavior in the future. And what I just described for you is our definition of engagement. It's a word in the industry that's very popular. It's very rarely defined. And I think the, the first lesson of consumer neuroscience is that if we understand what's going on in the brain, we can make precise definitions. So engagement is attention to something that emotionally impacts you and leaves a memory trace. And, and, and for our marketers who are in the business of advertising and selling products, hopefully that then uh, changes people's uh, behavior in a way that leads them to have a higher probability of making a purchase. Now, in, in part of that definition, and this I think has become more and more obvious as uh, people like Dan Kahneman and others have written popular books, is that the brain operates on many, many levels. But one simple way of thinking about it is that it fundamentally has these two systems of operations, sometimes referred to as, as system one and system two. And one metaphor for thinking about this is, is an airplane, right? And so sometimes that airplane is an autopilot. And, and the, the pilot doesn't actually have to do much. The computer uh, and other systems are working in the background doing, doing the work for them. And that's what we refer to system one, which is very fast. It's automatic. It's intuitive. It's instinctual. It happens first, quickly, and we are often blind to what it is doing. Now, the other system is more the, the, uh, the pilot mode, when the pilot takes over the controls. Uh, and there, conscious processing kicks in. And that's sometimes referred to as system two, which is much more slow. It's considered. It's effortful. It's focused. Uh, and, and, and it's second. Uh, and this lists lazy. I don't particularly like lazy. Clearly, we evolved to have these two systems because we can't possibly consciously think about every decision we make. Um, and uh, with the exception of me, I presume most of you slept last night. And, and, and why do we spend a third of our life sleeping? Uh, well, there's, there's, uh, there's a big debate about that. But, but one of the major functions of sleep uh, is to restore neurotransmitters and allow us to consolidate important memories and, and let go of memories that don't matter. But if we have these two systems in the brain, and if for really centuries the majority of market research has been talking to people using surveys or focus groups, then we've really only been talking to one system. And so the, the promise of consumer neuroscience is that finally there are tools and techniques that allow us to at some level tap into uh, this fast thinking or, or system one. And so consumer neuroscience quite simply is the application of neuroscience knowledge and techniques applied to market and media research questions for a deeper understanding of consumers' attitudes and behaviors. 
Forever we've been using surveys and focus groups uh, and, and really only talking to part of the brain. And what consumer neuroscience has done is expanded that toolbox. Now I started a, a company out of the MIT Media Lab in 2006 uh, that was purchased by Nielsen in 2015. But in 2006, there were several fun, uh, companies in this space. And there was a lot of promise and a lot of hype and a lot of negative and positive publicity. But at that time, each company was focused on really one methodology. So we were what, what we refer to as a biometrics firm. So we were using heart rate and skin conductance uh, primarily as a measure of engagement. There were other companies using EEG. There were other companies focused on eye tracking. And what the industry learned, and I think uh, over time uh, we, we would all agree this is the case, is that no one of these technologies has a monopoly on the truth of what's going on in the brain. And that really having multiple measures is the best way to approach. So today, Nielsen, uh, which is the largest provider of consumer neuroscience in the world by far, um, has a suite of tools. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on these, but uh, from the right, starting with EEG, this is a direct measure uh, of brain activity. We use 32 sensors, medical grade uh, technology. Uh, the biometrics I measured, heart rate, skin conductance, combined into a measure using various algorithms that, that look across an audience. Facial coding uses computer vision that allows us to, without any sensors, capture the different features on people's face and tell whether they're smiling, whether they're frowning, or they're looking surprised. Um, eye tracking, which I'll show you some examples of, it's probably the easiest one for people to get their heads around, uh, uses infrared cameras to triangulate and tell within a fraction of a centimeter precisely where someone is looking. And then again, we, we look across an audience to compare things. And then we do talk to people. Um, although there are many biases in what people say, there are certain things even these technologies can't pull out of people uh, without some conscious self-report. So these are our tools, and we like to say we use the best tool uh, for the job. And we apply these in a variety of areas. Uh, one of the most common one is advertising. I'll show you some examples of that tonight. Uh, we also do package research in the shopper domain. We work with uh, some of the biggest networks uh, on their programming and understanding the interaction between program content and advertising, um, we do product testing, and we also have done some custom work where we'll literally uh, monitor people while they're driving to monitor stress. Uh, we've worked with some of the uh, airline uh, manufacturers to develop the, the interior of the airplanes of the future. So, um, so that's sort of a, a fun practice. And just give you a sense of the, the scale we're talking about today uh, for Nielsen, each one of these cities in the black boxes represents some place where we have a physical lab now I'm going to describe uh, a, a couple studies in a bit, um, one of which allowed us to monitor people in their homes, but 99.9% .9 of the testing we do is in a physical location. We recruit people to come in, they sign a simple one-page consent form, they get paid an incentive to essentially wear, wear health monitors to watch media and advertising. And to date, I'm happy to report, no one's ever gotten hurt. And, uh, and, and we take uh, measures from a small group of people and then we, we infer and project that onto a, a larger population. Okay, so lesson number one from consumer neuroscience is that, uh, that the brain has these two modes and there are different technologies that allow us to tap into what's happening in system one and combine that with other measures of system two to get a more complete view of consumers. Lesson two uh, is something that uh, again, came up a little bit earlier today on the panel, and it's a topic that uh, I have actually witnessed change in, in the 12 years I've been doing this. And this is the explosion in our consumption of media over time. I'm gonna show you data now from a different division of Nielsen. This is the, the watch side of the business. So this is, if, if you're familiar with Nielsen at all, you're probably familiar with the ratings business, right? The Super Bowl happens, 110 million people watch. How do we know that? Uh, that's from Nielsen panels. Uh, and, and their uh, statistical measures. As a, as a quick side note, uh, A.C. Nielsen, uh, who, who founded the company over 90 years ago, uh, is actually famous uh, for developing the concept of market share. After World War II, uh, with some government funding, he would send people into stores to count the number of soup uh, cans and the number of flour bags on the shelves, and then started doing uh, math and, and literally created the concept of market share. So, so without measurement, it's very hard for, for business to, to proceed. But the thing that Nielsen's uh, most popular for is, is measuring audiences with media. And I think this is really illustrative to see how things have changed. And I know it might be a little hard in the back to see this. On the left uh, is 2002, and we're gonna go all the way to 2017. 
And I'm going to start here where we're looking at is the hours per week, the average hours per week of adults in the U.S., 18 and older, how much time they spend consuming media. And we're going to start with radio. Uh, it's fairly flat. There's a little bit of a drop from 2015 to 2017, uh, but it's actually been quite consistent. When we go to live TV, the next bar, you see there's a little drop uh, between 2007 and 2012. 2011 was the first year in the history of Nielsen ratings that live television viewers among, viewership among Americans dropped. Now, do you honestly think Americans were consuming less media? No. So let's see what happened. We're going to start stacking other bits of the graph and show you what's been going on since 2002. So in 2002, on average, Americans were spending about 48 hours a week consuming media. Flash forward to 2017, it's up to 75 hours per week. That is a full-time job and a half consuming media. The numbers for 2018, first quarter, uh, came in, uh, obviously, a few months ago. And somehow, Americans have found another hour per week. We are consuming, on average, 11 hours a day. How is that possible? Well, there's really only two ways that's possible. The first is mobile devices allow us to consume media in places we never could before, right? That's the obvious one. The other one is media multitasking, right? The TV's on, but you're surfing the web. Or you're studying and you're streaming Spotify, or you got Facebook open. And putting aside the fact that we know from a neuroscience perspective that multitasking of any sorts reduces productivity and increases error rate, even though you think you're working better, you're actually not, um, it also has an impact on advertising. So I want to show you a, a study we did. So this is a, a, a rare study where we actually were in people's homes. We talked earlier uh, about people having uh, some glasses on where we can record the point of view that they have. And we did this across uh, two populations. We had, again, it's a little hard to see at the bottom, a younger population <coughs> excuse me, that we called digital natives. They're aged 21 to 27. And then we had an older population, uh, digital immigrants, aged 31 to 55. So the idea is that the immigrant, of which I'm a card-carrying member, remembers a time before the internet. Uh, the, the native uh, would only know a world where the internet was involved and, and uh, couldn't actually remember a time before that. And we, we did a lot of data. I'm only going to show you two slides from this study. But the, the one that got the headline is this one, which is as we were coding the data, and we had hand coders look at the video. We had 300 hours of video um, in people's homes. We didn't monitor them outside of their home. But basically in the morning from the time they got up till they went to work, in the evening when they got home to the time they went to bed, and part of the weekend. And we noticed there was an awful lot of switching going on. They were switching from, from one platform to the other a, a lot. And, and we were coding it, so we said, well, let's come up with a metric of media attention spans. And so we did that. And when we look at the digital immigrants, the older population, their attention span, they switch about 17 times per hour. When we compare that to the digital natives, they're switching 27 times per hour. That's a 60% increase in the amount of switching. If you do the math on that, it's almost a 38% decrease in their attention span. Now, the obvious question uh, that, that one might raise if you look at this data is, well, hold on. Is this the impact of growing up in a world where there, was, uh, where there was internet and where there wasn't? Or is this an age effect? Do we just get longer attention spans as we get older? We repeated the study five years later with a larger sample. Uh, and the results are essentially good news and bad news. So the good news is uh, people's attention span have only decreased a, t a tiny little bit. Uh, and it's not statistically significant uh, over that five-year period. And as people get older, their attention spans do get longer. The bad news is, when I looked at the literature to find a comparison of just, you know, how do you get your head around 27 times per minute? That's an interesting thing. I found a study in 2008 where they actually took uh, children, uh, 12 months, 18 months, and 36 months, and they put them in a room with the TV on. And they put Jeopardy on in the background. And they used Jeopardy because they were hoping that wouldn't be so interesting to a three-year-old. And then they gave them toys. And they basically watched how often they would look at the screen and get distracted by that and play with the toys. And they counterbalanced the order, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting uh, about the three-year-old's attention span is it's not much longer than the digital natives. And in fact, digital natives have an attention span closer to a three-year-old than they do to a fully formed prefrontal cortex in an adult. And I think that is uh, potentially a very scary proposition. 
Now, the other question that emerges here is, well, why, why do people do this? Why are they switching screens all the time? Oh, there was a, a new term to me introduced this morning, dopamine lollipops, uh, which in, in some ways is redundant. But it also suggests to me that, that we're starting to be familiar with the fact that the reward systems in the brain are very powerful drivers. But it's very hard to get to the reward systems without going first through the emotion system. And one of the things we notice in this and other data is that a lot of that switching, when you now layer in the physiology, the biometric data, they were wearing a biometric device through these 300 hours, you, you start to see an interesting pattern that's different in these two populations. So first we'll start with uh, the, the digital immigrant, we'll call him Isaac. This is now a single sample, uh, person, and this is a couple hours in his evening, uh, the color codes to what platform he's on, and uh, the, the height of that bar represents uh, his deviation from his average throughout the day. So we could see evening media consumption is actually quite engaging for him. Uh, you can also see that, that there's a lot of brown there where the TV's on, but he's actually reading a newspaper. There's a stretch of about 30 minutes, those high blue bars there where he's really engaged with the TV. He then switches over to a magazine, calms down a little bit, and, and goes to bed. Well, let's compare him to Nate, our digital native. And the first thing you should notice is the colors have changed. And what we see is instead of uh, brown, we see fuchsia or pink, uh, and that's because the TV's on and he has a, an iPad. Uh, but the other thing you should notice is that the levels are a little bit higher and a little more consistent. And then if you squint, you would see that there's actually more striations, more switching. That's that 27 uh, versus 17 switching that's going on. And what we think is going on, and we've seen this in other data, is that people use media as a mood regulator. The minute someone gets bored, they pull out another device and they look for a, a little bit of arousal. And whether that's dopamine driven or just driven by our desire, desire to be sort of turned on, um, it's, it's happening more and more and more. And the consequence of this is that it's higher to get to peaks in emotion. So you're raising the floor so people don't drop as low because you're always being stimulated, but you're also lowering the ceiling. And we could think about or talk about during the panel one of the consequences of that. But my job isn't necessarily to to scare people and think about the consum consuming media. In fact, there are uh, folks who uh, don't want to be reminded of this because it makes their job advertising to people harder. Um, but if I haven't convinced you that people are distracted, I'm going to show you one more study. And this is now going back into the lab. And this is using, uh, similar to that switching, it's just behavioral coding. So we're not asking people anything. Uh, we're not using any fancy technology. We're just literally coding what they're doing in, an, in a semi-naturalistic uh, perspective. And this study had four cells, I'm only gonna show you two. The first cell uh, is a solo viewing, come on in, you can't have any other devices, here's a remote control, watch TV for an hour, uh, watch like you would at home. And the blue represents the content, the purple represents uh, the advertising, and the yellow is channel changing. This is the way we like to think, or certainly our clients like to think people watch TV. Okay, second cell, come on in, but now you can have your smartphone or iPad. Third cell, come on in, bring a friend, Neither one of you can have technology. Fourth cell, come on in, bring a friend, and you can bring your smartphone or your iPad, whatever you normally do at home. And this is what that looks like. <laughs> so now we're not only coding what's on the TV, but we also have to code what's on each, each person's phone. We have to code who they're talking to. Sometimes they're looking at the other person's phone, and sometimes they're looking at the television, and sometimes they're changing channels. And this is the environment in which advertisers have to break through and, and try to engage you. And so the, the second lesson of consumer neuroscience is that the bar is higher than ever for advertisers to actually engage people. You can't just throw up an ad and, and hope people will watch it uh, because they have far, consumers have far too much choice and they're, they're far too savvy, so they, they have to be more engaging. Okay, the, the next lesson um, is gonna involve some eye tracking here. Uh, there was a reference, uh, I think, earlier uh, to advertising. Uh, in, in the online world, uh, and we can, we can talk about that. But as more and more video advertising starts to move into the digital platform, marketers actually have a real dilemma. And that dilemma is, well, why can't I just take the ad I made for TV and, and, and put it online, right? They don't have unlimited budgets. These things cost sometimes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to produce. Um, and that was a legitimate question. And so we did a series of studies. I'm gonna show you uh, really just a, a, a teaser of that. I'm gonna show you one ad, and this ad uh, happens to be for Acura. We're not picking on Acura. It just illustrates a point. Um, and I'm gonna show it to you twice with eye tracking overlaid. The first time is gonna be seen on a 50-inch television. Think, you know, nice big screen at home. 
And the eye tracking shows where people's eyes are going. And why I like this ad is there's a couple moments where there's some, some copy text. And watch the eye tracking and see the branding at the end. See if you think they're, they're paying attention. And then I'm going to show you a second time how consumers view it on an iPhone. new TLX from Acura. So what do you think? Are people paying attention? Yeah, you can see when that copy comes up, they start at the left, they move to the right, the tagline comes up, they look at the logo. People actually pay attention and they consume advertising when, when they're not distracted. So that's on a TV. Now I'm going to show you the same ad uh, on, on a different audience, but, but equivalent demographics and, and, and age and whatnot on an iPhone. See if you notice a difference. The all new TLX from Acura. Same or different? Different. What did you notice? Uh, they're they're, they're kind of not moving around as much. They're certainly not following that copy and reading it. And they're kind of shifted to the right where the home button is because they want to get out of there. So the third lesson of consumer neuroscience is online, shorter is better, brand early, often, and big. And this is one that uh, our clients have, have taken to heart. OK. so. Uh, when it comes to advertising, with the bar being higher than ever, you, you have to make better ad creative, right? Ads have to be engaging. So how do you do that? So one of the things we've learned is that the way you do that is through uh, telling emotional, uh, emotionally compelling stories that have relatable characters, that take you on a journey, that integrates the brand, product, or service, and that that brand is actually attached to that ad at some level. Uh, but we're all sort of familiar with ads that are, that are sort of fun and entertaining, but, but actually you don't remember what they're for. And that's why they also should have a message. And importantly, it has to be tied to the brand. The biggest mistake we see advertisers make is that they either don't have a message, or it's not connected to the brand, or worse, they're advertising their competition uh, or raising the category, which is fine for the category, but not so good uh, for, for your particular brand. So I want to show you just one quick example of, of how we do this. And this work comes from uh, one of our clients. It's the Ad Council. Uh, the Ad Council is sort of famous for Smokey the Bear. Uh, they are the largest producers of public service announcements. And we do this work pro bono. And in exchange for doing it pro bono, we're allowed to talk about it. Because P&G won't let us get up here, or other companies won't let us get up here and, and talk about what we do. So what I'm going to do here is uh, show you an ad the way we received it. This is produced by a big agency. Um, Often our clients ask us, well, you know, all this, this research and all this technology is kind of complicated. Can't you just tell us how to do it? And, and this is a great example, right? So we all know that, that uh, pets are cute, right, and engaging. And branding's simple, right? You just put the brand at the end. So this agency used a cute puppy and put the brand at the end. Let's see how they did. This, by the way, is an ad for what's called Shelter Pet. This is for pet finding. So the idea here is to convince people in the market for a dog not to go to a breeder or a store, but to actually go and find a, a pet online that they could rescue, a rescue dog. So let's see what they did. So the dog's name is Jules. Jules is very engaging. Every time Jules is on screen, there's a big spike in the EEG. Uh, and that's wonderful, right? Except when you look at the eye tracking, he's so engaging over here that everyone's looking at the dog instead of reading the text. 
And everyone's looking at the dog on the left instead of looking at, at the brand. So this is a short version of the, of the results presentation, but they took that and then created this ad. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. So what'd you notice different, right? Now there's a voiceover. How important do you think that is in an age where people are doing this all the time? Uh, and get the dog out of the way when you're doing your messaging, right? So fourth lesson of consumer neuroscience is small changes can make uh, a big difference. Uh, this went out into the market. We had 133% increase in website visits and nearly a 30% increase in database searches for uh, shelter pets. I'm gonna end uh, with the fifth lesson, um, and this is sort of how, how do we know this works? And we've uh, been fortunate enough being within Nielsen and, and doing this for a long time that we're able to actually get in-market sales data, and, and that allows us to sort of look and see which one of these methodologies actually is doing the best job at predicting uh, behavior in market. Um, and this is a complicated slide. It's across 60 ads with uh, uh, what's called single source data. So this is actually um, opt-in panels that, that Nielsen manages where, where people actually um, are, uh, allow Nielsen to track every purchase they make and they allow Nielsen to look and see every ad that's shown on their TV. And you can then compare homes that saw the ad with homes that didn't see the ad, and then look to see if there's a lift in the sales in market, right? So very powerful use of big data um, that is one of the currencies in, in advertising. And when you look at these neuroscience measures and see which ones do the best job of predicting sales, you see that facial coding does okay at around 9%, Traditional surveys at 24%, biometrics at 27%, EEG at a whopping 62%. But interestingly, when you combine them, you get to close to 77%, and then finally adding the surveys, 84%. This is the variance predicted in a model. Um, and that suggests you know, we're able to actually measure the creative quite well. And, and we can give our clients uh, good recommendations uh, about how to engage people. And I'll end by bringing it back to the brain. Um, I haven't mentioned fMRI very much um, for, for various reasons we can talk about on the panel. Uh, it hasn't really broken out as a technology for consumer neuroscience, but we do use it in the way that academics do to try to understand what's going on uh, at a mechanistic level. And one year, uh, every year we used to do a Super Bowl study. We would recruit people in, come watch the Super Bowl, um, bring a friend so it's a, a festive atmosphere. Uh, they had to wear a biometric device. We serve pizza and beer. One beer per quarter, that wasn't the goal of the study. <clears throat> and the only requirement is that they had to be in the room in their seats when the advertiser was on. And that allowed us to actually capture and measure levels of emotional engagement using biometrics across all 50 national spots in the Super Bowl. And so one year we got this idea with some friends at Temple University who have a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging device in the business school. And we took people the next day, and we put them in the scanner, and we showed them the 10 most emotionally engaging ads and the 10 least emotionally engaging ads. And when you do fMRI studies, uh, as, as the neuroscientists know, you do what's called a subtraction technique. So you're sort of looking at the brains as they engage with the most engaging advertising, and then you subtract out the brains as they're watching and viewing the least engaging advertising. And what you're left with is this notion of residual brain activity. And when we did that this year, or that year, we found uh, something very, I think, interesting uh, to me in terms of what's really happening with engaging ads. We found activity in the hippocampus, the amygdala, superior temporal gyrus, and the lateral prefrontal cortex. And for those of you who aren't neuroscientists, we've, that translates into activity in the memory centers, emotion generation centers, areas that integrate sensory uh, sight and sound, and, and the reward centers of the brain. And in some levels, that wasn't super surprising because that's essentially what we would expect with engaging advertising. But this finding, I think, was surprising. So for another area that lit up, and these are very bright spots, right, in the brain, um, and for those of you who are neuroscientists probably recognize this as the default mode network, uh, this is a network in the brain that resonates when things are of personal relevance, when we're, when we're thinking about ourselves and thinking about our lives. That actually became active when they were highly engaged with advertising. And, and I'll leave you with the, the fifth lesson, uh, which is over the course of the last 10 years, I think there's been a very large shift 
uh, in advertising. When I joined advertising in 2006, I knew nothing about it, but I had an impression. And that impression was that advertisers are authorities, they use rational arguments to persuade people to buy things. And, and I've definitely seen a shift. I have definitely seen a shift. And that shift over the last decade has been from authorities to authentic, from rational to emotional, and from persuaders to engagers. And I think that shift is because the neuroscience tells us that's what people want. If you ask 100 people, do you like advertising, 99 will say, no, I don't like advertising. If you ask 100 people, do you like getting new information about new products, 99 out of 100 will say, yeah, I like getting new information about new products. Advertising ceases to be advertising when it's personally relevant. And uh, with that, I will stop and hopefully turn us over to an interesting discussion. Thank you for your time. I think the reason that many people hold the concept of neuromarketing ambivalently is because the final products, uh, while in some sense you implicitly consent because you've turned on your screen, um, uh, people are increasingly afraid that even though Carl tells them they have not discovered a buy button in your brain, uh, that, uh, that somehow your behavior can be influenced. There were these myths of subliminal presentations of commands, you know, go out and buy, you know, Coke, right? Um, and, 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 and so this is a field that has been um, treated with some both respect but also fear by the general public. And Reed, I know you, you were the author of a early study comparing Coke versus Pepsi and it was, I, you know, it was in, published in Nature Neuroscience. I thought it was a really very interesting paper, but then I realized that you had started a moral panic. Um, uh, and I wonder if you could quickly um, just tell a little bit about that right. story. It was, it was 14 years ago. It was published in Neuron. Or Neuron. Um, yeah, yeah. My 16-year-old my daughter was in the lab and had to do a project. And we wanted to pick something that was, um, it's a neuroimaging part of my lab. Um, using fMRI, as Carl showed you some images from that before. So we wanted to pick something where uh, at least her perception of the physical stimulus uh, was almost identical. So brown fizzy sugar water, Coke and Pepsi. But the subjective preference was divergent, okay? There are Coke drinkers and there are Pepsi drinkers and people will often beat their hands on the desk and insist on one being better than the other. Um, so we gave people a, uh, if you remember, the, anybody remember the early 80s with the coat? Okay, and so they would pull the card up and mm -hmm. invariably Pepsi would win and it inspired Coke to actually run off and make that sweeter version and drop classic Coke and it was kind of a, a train wreck for them, I think, for a while. Um, so we did it, you put it, we, they, they did taste tests outside the scanner with cups that weren't marked and if you do a taste test with cups that are not marked, in other words, you do not know what you're drinking, you cannot tell the difference. Now, I know there's somebody in there who goes, that's absolutely false. If you gave it to me, I can tell the difference at all. Now, the, the, the little proviso here is it was defizzed, okay? And we put you in the scanner, and there's a region of your brain that can tell the difference, and I can tell what you're gonna pick um, on, a, on a task where I cue it meaning I tell you it could be Coke or Pepsi or it's definitely Coke or it's definitely Pepsi. Okay, so what we ended up measuring was the response of your brain to a Coke squirt where it was signaled six seconds before by a Coke can and the response of your brain to a Coke squirt where it was signaled six seconds before by a, a brushed aluminum can. So in the one case, you know it's Coca-Cola, and that you, you were told with the brushed aluminum was that it could either be Coke or Pepsi, and it was 50-50 chance, okay? The only difference is one has this hovering view of what you're thinking, and there's no difference physically in those two stimuli, and you know, people's <coughs> brains loved Coca-Cola. The interesting thing was, in the behavioral domain, that was very hard to parse people apart, but you could eavesdrop on their brain and tell what they were gonna pick by looking at responses to different regions of their brain. And it set off a giant Moral uh, panic. Panic. <laughs> yeah. And Ralph Nader's yeah. anti commercialization group called Commercial Alert um, threatened to sue us, and he wanted to debate me on stage. And because I was going to, as Carl said, I was going to turn people into thoughtless zombies who would wander around drinking Coke, uh, which is what happens anyway. Um, 
So uh, that's calmed down, yeah. I think. But OK, so I wonder if either Carl or Uma have a, com a comment on, you know, this, again, this, that wasn't ambivalence, but this ambivalence about neuromarketing and what the ethical, if is an ethical reflection on um, what this, either the response to Reed was or more tempered responses to the idea of neuromarketing. The response to me was quite violent. I yeah. Mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, that was the initial response, um, but I think um, Reed's paper is, is held out in the field as seminal because what it taught us is that there is a brain basis to brands. And if you think about where the word brand comes from, it actually comes from branding cattle, right? You sort of sear and mark your cattle so you know which, when they go straying, which ones are yours and which ones aren't. And at some level, that is what advertising is all about. You're, you're trying to make a mark uh, in people's brains about a particular brand that would inspire purchase. Um, and, and the idea that there was a brain basis to this was very new. Uh, prior, prior to his paper, it didn't exist. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you think about it from a neuroscience perspective, it's not surprising, right? right? If something is going to uh, influence what you wear, what you buy, how you dress, who you vote for, it probably changes your brain. Um, and, and, and we now know that you know, 30 years later uh, in much greater detail, um, but, but it doesn't mean, you know, again, that we can sort of today flip a switch um, and, and make people let go of free will. Now, I think at some point we should talk about the future, but yes. that's, why, yeah. that's why we're here. Right, that's why we are here. Uma, do you want to make a comment? And then, exactly, I think we should talk about the future. Sure. So I think this difference between recording and inducing was a real concern for a lot of people early on in, in understanding what neuromarketing was. And I know there are extremely well-informed people in this audience, but if you say that we know something about how you think, that feels very personal. And uh, there is a lot of concern about veracity in advertising and undue influence in advertising. And you, you could get a sense for this in terms of people's concern over the way that McDonald's formulates its food and how addictive it's perceived to be. And so there was, I think, a not unreasonable worry in terms of people who might hear a neuromarketing study in terms of knowing what that actually entailed. Like I said, I can't sneak up on you with an fMRI scanner, but there was not a good sense of what a neuromarketing study or what neuromarketing data meant and how much of it was influenced directly versus measuring a response. Um, that distinction is critical. I think it's, it's gotten to a point where it's, it's better communicated. And I, you know, one of the interesting things, in, in my opinion, about the Coke Pepsi study is that it shows the efficacy of Coke as a brand but not necessarily that Coke makes you drink sugar fizzy water. So um, that change in understanding and a recognition of what advertisers could and couldn't do, and, and quite honestly, I suspect there's still some education in, that could be done better, uh, whether on the part of the companies or the academics or anyone involved, um, that distinction, I think, would help significantly with the moral panic and maybe was under, uh, not, uh, undervalued but, but underpredicted by people who were doing that kind of research. I literally had someone at a marketing conference, so someone who was invested on the marketing side, who was in a market research firm, argue against fMRI research being done for any market purposes because it stole away time that should have, where those scanners should have been used for patients. Uh, and I had to explain that that's, that's not how this works. No patient is not getting a scan because someone's doing a marketing study. Yeah. But uh, that's that someone who is, you know, uh, on the side of the marketers, worked in a marketing firm and was extremely concerned themselves. That, that was actually the complaint about my paper. Was, was that it? That's where it came from. Probably no, that, that's what they were so, gonna. Yeah. That was what they were gonna um, sue us for. And uh, so I invited it. Sue me, and if you want to debate me, debate me. You see, uh, if in fact there is a way to skirt around your willful choice then what are you going to do? Chase it inside in a private company? Or are you going to expose it? You, it's important to understand the kinds of things that allow you to have deliberative choice step in the way of stuff. And the kinds of, if there are going to be these things, if there is going to be a buy button or something like that, the things that kind of take away your willful choice. You would like to know that. And so what I told Commercial Alert at the time, I mean, maybe somebody here works for them. Um, I said, you're on the wrong side of this issue. 
I'm exactly on the side of the issue of exposing how your brain makes these sorts of deliberations and whatnot. Wouldn't you hate it if somebody had a little trick that they played on you for 20 years until it got uncovered in the laboratory? And so that went away from me. They actually sued Emory University. There was a company at Emory University, I think, that got um, a letter about it. It calmed down after a while. I'd just like to add something to it, though. It doesn't mean that we won't discover some that, way to do that. Right. Okay? That's number one. I, I, it's not clear how that will go. And the second thing is that there's, a, there's an entire world coming now for decoding brain activity yes. that falls short of what neuroscientists would want, which is a theory of how does the brain work? Can we decode your brain that way? What we've realized is with modern machine learning methods now, as long as you have a useful way to look at brain activity and you say, I'm not really sure how your brain's doing this thing, let's say lying, uh, and I can sample 100,000 spots in your brain simultaneously for half an hour, but I can figure out when you're lying, okay? I can, in a context, let's say. Let, let me just contextualize it. Okay, well, does that mean I know how it is your brain generates things that it calls truth and monitors that? No, but it gives me a very practical device to do this thing that may or may not be good for society. And so, you know, I mean, we have Fourth Amendment rights for our living room. We ought to have there are a lot of technologies coming now that will allow eavesdropping at a distance. And let me just wait. One more yeah, point. Yeah, no, 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 this is, no, no, this is. The other point is this. You're, uh, bit, you're terrifying everyone. Which are is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. OK, yeah. so this is what's going on inside your head. There's been an arms race for keeping that stuff inside your head for as long as there's been life evolving. OK, now we have companies that have data from 500 million, a billion people, where you have external proxies for almost anything you could name. Okay? If I have, if I can look at your web searches over the last 10 years, I can decide what kind of diseases you're getting, what you're buying, what you're eating, what you may be excreting, what's ha okay. So I'm, there may be data in there that says a whole lot of stuff about your mental and physical state, okay? So that, that kind of decoding is already happening. The same sort of thing is going to go on with brain science as well. We're going to be able to decode things from your brain that we never guessed that we could, and it's coming faster than even the professionals can anticipate it. And people are worried about this. I think there was a recent um, uh, assembly at the National Academy to discuss yes. just this issue. We're, we're surprised. It, it, the step is this. Instead of saying, okay, we really know how the brain works now, we say, it would be very useful to know whether or not you're going to turn right or left given this arrangement of signs at, let's say, a, 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 an intersection, and just look at brain activity to decide which way you're going to turn, okay? Well, we can do that quite effectively. It'd be very useful to know how these people are going to vote, given some sort of arrangement of words on a screen or images or uh, music or all kinds of things like that. In fact, we're very good at that now. Now, we don't understand how it is right. that your brain activity is mapping onto that, but you can establish a mapping between yeah. your sort of political leanings and your response to emotionally evocative images, for example. And that's just a number of issues. So that's coming, and that it's for us to decide how to manage that on the front end because it'll come faster than we can imagine because there are now mobile technologies um, that are coming. There's one based on atomic clocks that allows you to move around, uh, that's extremely fast and light and cheap. Um, it's on the early days now. It's sort of a couple of years old. But um, if you don't have to lie in the belly of a 30,000-pound magnet with cryogen in it, um, that's a plus. And you could start doing younger and younger people. And so that's something to so, – so there are worries, yeah. actually. So I'm going to ask Carl to comment on how good is, in your view, how, how good is this going to get. And then I think we should talk a little bit about – uh, how it might be regulated in a way that is appropriate. So, Carl. Yeah, I get, I get asked often, so what, is, you know, what does the next 5, 10, 15 years look like uh, from my perspective? And I think what, you know, the typical answer to that is you know, faster, smaller, cheaper, better, right? So uh, our clients live in a world where even though we can sometimes turn a study around in, in two weeks, that's just too long. They need it in two hours. Um, and, and that's just physically impossible today to recruit people to a lab, wire them up, collect the data, clean the data, process that data, visualize the data, interpret that data, deliver that data. That, that just takes time. Um, and so part of, uh, you know, I, I agree with Reed, what he's saying is um, the field of consumer neuroscience could get eclipsed by big data. 
because it's just faster and, and cheaper to decode massive data sets that are already available because we're all leaving digital cookie crumbs everywhere we go mm -hmm. um, and, and that data is being traded and, and then the targeting comes and, and, and you know, I may be out of a job. Um, and so, so I think a bigger concern is when you lose consent uh, doing that, right? We're all familiar with clicking I agree to you know, 100 page um, co legal contracts that nobody reads, but yet you know, get enforced. So, so I think that, that is a, a, big, a big trick. And I think in terms of regulation, you know, the big challenge with regula regulation in, in, in any of these uh, technologies is that the technology is moving faster than, than governments ever possibly could. So by the time a government got around to actually putting a law down, it would either be obsolete or companies would have already figured out a way around it. Um, and I don't, but, I don't mean but, we should no, try. No, no, but, but how about a, a, a framework? I mean, one of the things we heard this morning, and I know a lot of people weren't here this morning, but we're just talking again about digital phenotyping, was we're going to know an enormous amount about people, and you can't stop that from happening in, in any reasonable manner. But would it be possible to, to regulate the use of that data? And um, I don't know. Uma, do you have a view on, on that, or should, you know, is it, is it feasible to say uh, if, if this technology gets really good, um, you can use it for X, Y, and Z, right, but, but you can't use it for, you know, this particular purpose, or does so, that so seem just too far-fetched? I'm not a legal scholar, yeah. so I have no idea how yeah. that works, but I, I would be inclined to say, just as someone who thinks about these issues is how would you know uh, <laughs> whether they had stayed in the bounds once the data is there? Um, I, I think the other thing, just w which still doesn't quite answer the question, but maybe adds on to it, I I'm not convinced there's a separation between big data and yeah. the data that we, that companies, whether it's academics, maybe there's a separation because we work on our, our own collected data, but you know, Nielsen has big data too. So I'm not convinced that it's, you know, big data is doing this and then brain data will do that. Um, I think that the problem should be addressed overall with the idea and with the likelihood that they're going to be combined. I mean, even if I run a 17-person study in the lab and I, I scan uh, more people than that, let's say 30, 40-person study in the lab, and uh, I scan those people, they're not not saying anything. I'm collecting behavioral data from them as well. And so we, you know, there's the digital phenotyping, but if, I mean, somebody already has all of that public data on the same people that are being part of these other scans and things like that. So I, I think it should be considered as an ecosystem and not as two separate problems or even with one problem informing the other, but with a recognition that these <coughs> technologies are advancing and the analytics for them are advancing. And again, the point which I think was very eloquently made that you don't actually have to get the brain science accurate as long as your prediction is accurate. Right. Just, just to clarify in defense of Nielsen. So, um, Sorry, I didn't mean <laughs> to do that. It's okay. <laughs> Part of my job. Uh, no, that there is a difference between third-party data collection, which is transparent, opt-in, and follows uh, a, a certain set yes. of guidelines that is set, actually, in some cases, by the industry, is audited by the industry. So Nielsen is regularly audited for making certain standards. And the reason they are um, is in part because it's the right thing to do, but it's also in part so that um, people understand that they're a fair, fair cop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so Facebook and, and Google, um, you know, have to at some level share some of their data, they don't share all of it. The reason they have to share some of it is that, do you really trust, you know, Facebook and Google when they say 10 million people saw that, that, that ad or, or that show? Um, and that may be right, but they maybe didn't tell you, well, that was 10 million people over the course of an hour, not 10 million people monitoring on average every minute. So minute by minute ratings is a standard that Nielsen sets that actually when you do the math, turns out it was only 1.2 million people, apples to apples. So the point is in order to have a, a, a currency and, and a market, you have to have someone who's telling the truth, which I know is a much yeah. bigger topic, yeah. maybe yeah. beyond the discussion right. today. Right. Um, but that, that really is right. the difference. Whereas when you don't know 
um, what companies are doing with particular data sets because they're not forced to be transparent. I think that's where it gets a little right. trickier. And right. I should clarify, I'm not claiming that there's anything that's going on at Nielsen. I just meant to say that if we are able to collect these forms of data, then someone is clearly going to be able to collect all of them. Well, I think um, the, the interesting data aggregation from academics are, are uh, uh, we genotype lots of people and then people use ancestry websites and 23andMe and police departments have been able to piece together uh, cold cases, not by having the genotype of the person they've arrested, but by having family members, mm -hmm. right? And, and so everybody just, this is partly commercial big data, partly academic big data in the public domain, but we can re-identify basically almost anyone today. Well, and, right? and, and recall, and maybe this is the point you're trying to make, Uma, the, the Cambridge Analytica yeah. scandal, yeah. actually the back door was an academic yeah. institution yeah. that was contracted yeah. uh, to scrape Facebook right. through a back door Facebook had left open and then sold to a company that then right. sold to, you know, politicians. So so there's the, the ecosystem is, is very complex and there is a lot of data being traded around right. and, and that's where I think, you know. So I think in terms of you know, a regulatory scheme. So, so I think we've established this, depending on your point of view, optimistic or frightening scenario, <laughs> right? And we might, as uh, citizens, think that it would be really good if we could use these methods to convince people to exercise uh, and or otherwise engage in health behaviors. Uh, but we wouldn't think it was so good if we wanted to convince people to go out and set their neighbor's house on fire, right? I mean, to take ridiculous <laughs> examples, except that they're happening in different parts yeah. of the world. <laughs> right? that's, that's, so they're, they're not so ridiculous, right? That's right. Uh, and the question really is, is there a sensible legal or regulatory regime, right, in which this data could be channeled for licit beneficial purposes uh, and uh, not used otherwise? Let me thank uh, Carl and Reed and Uma for really fantastic uh, discussion. Well, thanks for and having thank us. Thank you. Thank you.